Okay, Daniel, if you want to jump in and say hello, and we just test audio, check, check, one, two, audio, audio. Yes, so there's also some video that's cool. Uh, I think one thing I just switched on the chat for everyone, um, it, it should be available now. If you guys could quickly um, hack into the PlayStation from where you're dialing in and maybe a little bit what you're doing if you're raising right now, that would be cool so that we had some context. And then I think uh, we will give it one or two more minutes and um, get going. Cam four. That's cam three, cam two. Oh my God. Oh, those lights work. It's amazing. There's like all these cameras on, but the camera that's on, the light is on that camera. So I know which is working. So this camera, that is like incredible witchery in the camera department. Excellent. 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 All right. Do you have enough chat traffic there, Daniel, that we could get ourselves going? You let me know. I am going to play with camera magic. <laughs> Yeah, it all looks good. Everything seems to work. And um... well, hey, not everything seems to work. I would say 60% <laughs> of it seems to work, but everything we need to do what we need to do today works. <laughs> not to be technical, but you know. What doesn't work, we make work somehow. <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> what doesn't work, we will make work. Uh, all right. Hey, hey, Dana, I'll just give you a little preview of what's happening today. Um, this is a mini velocity event. We're going to go about half hour, which means two and a half hours. No, but we'll try and get most of this in for a half hour. We're talking about raising money and what's happening today. This is a mini velocity event. Our bigger velocity events are, you know, up to three days long. So this should say mini velocity. But, uh, as I go through here, I will try and address you guys as personally as possible, but we're in the studio. Uh, we have some slides to walk you through. Uh, we're not, I believe, sending the slides around. And I don't think there's a replay. So if you see a slide you like, just use your uh, memory to memorize it. Or you could use your what phone. Is that? But what is that's that? plagiarism. <laughs> hey, do we have time for me to go through every slide and just put trademark on slides one after? Do we have uh, 40 minutes and then call legal? And make sure it's all uh, anyway these are my slides if you need to take a photograph of it because your memory is not working feel free to but i'm not sending the slides around okay so i oh. uh, just want to call a couple of people that actually took the time to tell us who they are and where they're from all right so we have jeff from new jersey which is cool welcome here we have scott lopez newport beach um port collins colorado taught from somewhere in the desert of Arizona, we have some people from Calgary uh, that are dealing with smoke. We've also been dealing with smoke here in the Northern California area. Um, from Las Vegas, from New York City, and we have people from the Netherlands. So I think we have to send them um, to bed quite soon. So be on time. And we have people from Carlsbad, imagine that, Paul Martin. Okay, cool. So I think um, everybody, everything seems to work. And um, I think let's get going. Okay, great, Daniel. I uh, appreciate it. So what I'd like to do is interesting. I'd like to put this uh, slide up. I don't generally just read word for word, but if we're going to start this event, I think this is really critical to understand what people whose job it is to move money day to day in and out of companies and what they are saying, all right? And I'll just read this to you. The stockpile of unspent private equity capital waiting to be invested will take 18 months to burn off, according to Michael Queen, chief executive of 3i. If you don't know who 3i is, it's one of the largest private equity groups. These guys see money moving every single day, they see what companies are doing, they see consumer demand, they know what's actually happening in the market. So uh, every once in a while, you'll see these guys on CNN and they give them like 45 seconds to explain what's happening in the European, US and global economy. So all you're getting is like a tiny snippet, but here's their summary. 
The stack of dry powder awaiting deployment is estimated to total around $490 billion globally. Um, as many uh, private equity fund investment pools draw to their end, this large pool of private equity capital needs to be spent. And this is resulting in highly motivated private equity buyers and a competitive auction process. The part of this that you need to care about, if there's anything here, there is a huge overhang of capital. And this is resulting in highly motivated private equity buyers and a competitive auction process. I don't think I need to break that down you know, any much further for anybody, but the, the way to think about it is this, and I'll show you another slide here um, in a moment, the, and it's right behind me. The money available to invest in your company, your deal, your companies today was not raised yesterday. It didn't just happen. A lot of that money was raised years and years and years ago. So think about it like this. If you look at this slide behind me, and th this is a slide we can send you. Uh, this is the amount of capital available in the market today. So whether you are in venture capital, private equity, debt, angel, retail, there's some version of this chart, which says even consumers, uh, but, but private equity firms raised money uh, in, in 2000. So if you look at this, in 2019, which is three years ago, there is, if you go over here, $100 billion of venture capital. That's not even private equity. $100 billion of venture capital that hasn't been invested. That's what this chart says. So that's venture capital. That's not private equity. That's not uh, uh, angel investments. That's not debt. Now, if you start to layer some of these charts in, this is debt, right? So if you look back 2017, the cumulative overhang is $200 billion. Venture capital overhang is uh, for that same period, $100 billion. Private equity, the capital overhang is $400 billion. And global uh, private dry powder by fund type uh, is $3.6 trillion. So what this is saying, and I'm, let me get up here in person, I'll show you this slide again. No matter what, what asset, class you're in, there's some poor portion of $3 trillion of global capital that is has been raised and has to get out the door into a deal. If you look at just in the US domestic market, that number is probably, if you look at private equity, if you look at debt, if you look at venture capital, if you look at angel and you look at some segment of retail, there's four or $500 billion that will be a fit for the people listening on this call uh, I understand you may not be running a, you know, a $4 billion public company, but there's $400 billion in the U.S. of private capital that needs to get out because it was raised three, four, five, six years ago. And if it doesn't get out, it has to go back uh, unused to the people that it was taken from, right? And so uh, if I flip back to here really quickly, and we'll, we'll talk about what to do with that. Let's see, maybe this one came to, here we go. So uh, these little boxes down here can have this slide. These are all the areas that capital can, can come into your deal. Venture capital, uh, there's certainly real estate, there's growth capital, there's infrastructure capital, distressed private equity, direct lending, buyout lending, secondaries, and other. If you just look at other, it's one of the largest categories. So that's angel, uh, venture capital, and one of the largest categories of capital that can and should go into your company doesn't even have a name to it. It's just random money that's floating around out there. So the, I think the takeaway here is if you're out there talking to people about putting money in your deal, a couple things are going on, and this is about how to raise money. Uh, so the, uh, the reality is the capital is out there it's you, not them. They have the capital. They want to get the capital out into deals. They're des maybe desperately is not. They're aggressively marketing. I go to the conferences. I get the emails. I go to the meetings. The guys with capital are looking for deals. If you have shown them your deal and you haven't gotten the money, well, something's wrong. That's what we're going to talk about here today. Not so much what to do that's right, but what's wrong? Because if you're following me and you're, you're diligently 
trying to sell your deal or your company and you're not getting traction, it's more likely that something's wrong than something needs to, there needs to be more money. The money is available, something you're doing is, is wrong. Um, so that is why I wanted to then hit you guys with this slide here. Where's my money, Oren? You're out there telling me there's 400 billion, you're drinking coffee. You got a couple, uh, you got people live, you know, watching you, they're expecting an answer. So if you're saying there's $400 billion that are trying to get into deals, one more sip of coffee to help this uh, concept go down. Where is my money? All right. The thing you have to think about, I know you want me to say, hey, fill out page one of your slide to say the problem, page two of your slide to say the solution, page three to be the economics, page four to be the competition. You got all that for now. Are there things you can do on your slide deck? For sure. But for the moment, I think we need to make sure it's a slide deck about the right things. So this is what we hear from investors. This is what we have to do to get capital into deals. And, and by the way, not theory. I'm out there doing every day. We just closed a $20 million deal. Uh, I think it was from the time. So we did some outreach, about two weeks of outreach. From the time the investor said, I'm interested and I want to close, it was 19 days, $20 million. So don't look at me and say, hey, this is all theory. I'm doing this for real. And now I'm cycling through another three or four deals. That's $300 million of capital. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but I'm doing this for real. And these are the issues we're facing. So number one, macros. It's very likely that your beautiful pitch deck, your presentation, everything that you know how to talk about is missing for the investor, a connection to what's happening in the broader economy, in your sector, in your industry. It's not enough to say uh, consumer spending is, is staying flat, inflation is rising, more people are going to the web, and they're more interested in educating their children uh, via software like we offer, whatever. That, that is not a macro. Everybody knows that. If you read the cover of USA Today, you know all those things. What is happening in your industry? So if you're in education, if you're in logistics, if you're in supply chain, if you're in SaaS, if you're in sales software, shit, I don't know. Um, if you are in media tech, if you're in equipment, if you're in manufacturing, if you're in electric vehicles, if you're in vehicle manufacturing, vehicle distribution, uh, uh, finance, real estate, oil and gas, gas or oil, multifamily, I mean, like these are all things we look at. You have to know what's happening. So just take for an example, one of those. Multifamily real estate. Multifamily real estate in Florida is different from multifamily real estate in California is different from multifamily real estate in Kansas. What is the macro in your geography? What, by, that, by that, I mean, what is changing in the market that is so dramatic that there's a need for what you're doing? Super easy to understand. In California, a $2 million house costs $5 million. Why? A dislocation in supply and demand. Is it getting better? No because the cost of, they're not making any more uh, coastal California. This thesis that people are leaving California for Texas because Joe Rogan left California and uh, um, the, the, you know, half the podcasters have left California. The, no, there's still lots of people in California and they all want to live somewhere. So you have to have a major macro that makes, that, that is dislocating markets so dramatically that what you're doing will absolutely work. The next thing is what channel of money are you going into? This I want to talk to you directly. I think a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of the mistakes you know, about, hey, where's my money? You're talking to people who don't have money or you're talking to a channel that doesn't invest in your kind of project. What I find is the biggest problem is you are out there talking to a range of people Somebody says, I'm interested, and you go, great. I have somebody raise his hand. I, I want to, uh, they, they're interested in my deal. This is a lead for capital. And then you invest tons of time and energy. You have to look and say, is this kind of person who's raised their hand, so I'm interested in my deal, really an investor for my company? Investors do lots of things that have nothing to do with writing checks. They look at different markets. They look at different kinds of industries. 
They want to be aware of what's happening locally. They're kind of, if you're in tech, everybody's interested in tech. Very few people write checks. So if you have a multifamily real estate deal in California on the coast, easy to understand. And somebody on the East Coast raises their hand and says, I'm interested. Much more likely that they're interested in learning about what's happening on the other side of the country than they are actually writing a check. Identify what is the right channel for the money that you're seeking. If you are an early stage tech company, you should be talking to guys who are proven uh, to have money and write checks for early state deals, not random real estate investors. If you're a pharmaceutical company, uh, you've got to talk to people who are in biotech, healthcare, and, and stick to your channel. Maybe you bump into Mark Cuban on a plane and he's like, oh, fuck, I love, excuse me. Maybe you bump into Ryan Reynolds on a plane and he's like, yeah, you know, I do acting and vodka, but I've always wanted to learn about educational software, right? And, but the likelihood of you jumping channels is low. Stick to your channel. What channel should you be in? This is, this is, a, this is a conversation that we would have to have. Like, if you don't know what channel you're in and you don't know where money is moving today into the kind of deal you have, we can have a conversation about it and we'll say the money you want is over there. The way you go get it is, uh, um, you know, there, there's ways to get into a channel. But how are you getting into the channel in which money is flowing today into your kind of deal? To me, that is the, the you know, probably the number one thing that causes you to say, where's my money, right? If there's $400 billion out there, how come I can't get $3 million, $5 million, $8 million, $80 million? Wrong channel, right? If you're in the right channel, the, uh, as I said before, have you got the macros? Uh, where are we? Uh, have you, uh, are the macros convincing in terms of, um, you know, is there sufficient change in the market that what you're doing, if, no matter how well you do it, is going to be important to that market? So those are two things. And then uh, the, the last two things are timing and stage. So uh, it's funny, we go out to an investor and they say no to our deal. And then three weeks later, a weaker deal goes to the same investor and they're often doing a deal. Timing is a huge part of this. There's part of time you can control and there's part of time you can't control. Uh, so, so I think if you're struggling with timing and you're seeing like you're talking to the right people, but you're left by two weeks or right by a month, You've got to set up a, a, you know, a modern day funnel to stay in contact with the investor lightly all the time. Uh, so if timing is your problem, we have a special group that, that uh, completely focuses on staying perpetually in contact with an investor in a nice way so they never get tired of you. So timing and then stage of deal. Uh, let's see, I don't want to invest too much time in that, but I would say six out of the 10 people I talk to don't know what stage of deal they're in, right? Yes, of course, early stage, mid stage, late stage. But I think investors think much more tactically in terms of what stage of deal this is. Most of the people who, who I work with are tweeners. If you're a tweener, if you're not a series A and you're not a series B, you don't have the traction and you're somewhere in between, okay? Uh, you don't, life is more difficult, but you don't give up have to be able to understand, I'm a tweener. How do I describe that to investors? What channel should I be in if I'm a tweener? What timing, how does timing affect my deal? How do I communicate? We know we're a tweener. We're not an A, we're not a B, we're not a growth company. Uh, but make the macro so giant, the shift in the industry so giant that the fact that you're a tweener is okay. These are the four variables that you have to play with if you're asking the question, where's my money? All right, so if we move on from here, uh, oh yeah, I just wanna put this slide up so you could take a picture of it. Let's assume for a moment your pitch deck, your financial model, your numbers are stable, you're still not getting money. These four variables are likely driving your inefficiency in getting capital into your company. Feel free to screenshot or take a photo of it, uh, just like Tabata. Three, four, two, one. All right, we're taking a break. <laughs>
uh, all right. What happened here? Cam three live there. All right. Uh, so I think what I'd like to do now is talk about hidden obstacles. These are easy mistakes that you can just, uh, everybody knows what an easy mistake is. I would say not to get too personal. <laughs> I make an easy mistake like every morning about 1.30 to 2.30 a.m. Well, I wake up and I have to pee, right? And so I get up and uh, uh, somebody has put Legos or shoes or, uh, you know, there's a massage chair or there's a cabinet or things I'm aware of that I trip into, hit, step on, or bump into on my way. And, and then that wakes me up further. And now I'm awake. Uh, why don't, before I go to bed, you know, just clear, take a bulldozer, clear all the Legos out of the way move all the shoes out of the way. And uh, those are my shoes. I put them there in the first place. Easy mistakes. Think about what are the easy mistakes you make in your life? Uh, coming to meetings late, Every, you know, and you're catching and you're flustered and then you don't have a lot of credibility. What do they say in the Navy? Uh, if you come to a meeting on time, you're late. If you come to it early, you're on time. And if you come to it late, you shouldn't even come at all. So easy mistakes in your industry. So um, these are the easy mistakes. Carl is sitting here on the other side. I can't turn the camera around, but Carl is here and he does our modeling, right? Um, we, I would say six out of the 10 companies that we work with and we say, hey, can you send us over your financial model? What they do is they send over basically an accounting export. So the, the, the easy mistake to avoid here is a financial model that makes sense. Doesn't have to be super complicated, right? But if somebody can immediately see, if you're a software company, see your churn. If you're a real estate company, um, see that the comps are declining in value. Uh, they can see what else happens bad in a model. Uh, your revenue is lumpy. Um, things just don't add up. Your assumptions, your marketing assumptions don't make sense for today's market. A bad model kills deals. I'll pause on that. That is just show people your model and stress test your model. You must have access to a banker, a, you know, a, a, a CFO, uh, an accountant. Just show them your Excel spreadsheet and say, does this make sense? Like, as you just work through the numbers, is there anything you see here that looks ugly, nasty, um, and, and, and uh, like a space alien, right? So bad model is just an easy mistake. This is... You could have a great product, you can have great traction, your market can love you, all kinds of great things can be happening to you, but your financial model, if it looks weird to financial people, that is a hidden obstacle to your financing success. Uh, and by the way, a model that looks good to you, you are not the right person to decide if your model is good or bad. Because if you look at your model, I'll tell you what you think it is. You think it's good. Why? Because it's your model. Why? Again, because it goes up and to the right. Why? Because if that model happens, you'll get rich. Why? If that model happens, you know, you'll be happy and, and your status will go up and people will be proud of you and your, your family will look up to you like, oh, papa, this is amazing. How have you done this? Oh, it's just a model up and to the right. Uh, so I know you think your model is good. Show it to somebody who looks at models every day and ask them what they think. And they're going to go, well, I mean, Nine out of 10 times ago, this doesn't make sense to me. Fix those things, bad model. All right. Uh, so the next thing is this macro shift. What is that? Cam4 Live? Oh, I see. Uh, the next thing is uh, this macro shift. If, I mean, we already talked about it, so I'm going to spend two seconds of it. If you can't explain to somebody why tectonic forces are splitting uh, the, the there, there's a fracture in the industry and market that you exist in, right? And that you are able to jump over to the, um, so when I say a fracture, think about it this way. You're sitting here on the coast of California and there's a earthquake, right? And um, San Francisco, San Luis Obispo crack off into the ocean, right? And you see that crack happening. And here you are like an action movie. You're, you're sprinting. For the crack, 
and investors are seeing that you're, you're jumping, you're in the air, and you are going to make it. You're going to make it to the mainland. And San Francisco and San Luis Obispo, sorry, are going to float off to sea and sink. And unfortunately, uh, Uber headquarters and DoorDash headquarters are going to sink into the ocean. And then you're going to have to go get your own food and drive yourself somewhere. But anyway, that's what you have to show people. There's a major fracture. Part of your industry is floating out to sea, going to sink and die. But you are jumping over to the mainland and can be safe. And then you're going to start the new Uber because the old Uber sunk. It's as simple as that. Okay, spending all day uh, talking about macros. So examples and numbers. I'm, I'm, this is such an easy topic and such a way to trip over your own feet. If you give an example why you're good, anchor it down with numbers. If you believe that you are going to invest $5 million in a multifamily asset on the coast of California, you're going to make some improvements and then you are going to um, be able to sell it in three years at a higher number, that's great. Give some examples of that happening. Give some real numbers of what the improvements you're gonna make. Give the exit cap rates. Uh, you can do it quickly and give why you believe those exit cap rates are achievable and tie down the, the, the fantastical things you say need to be tied down. A uh, Bunch of good salespeople out there on this call. I've talked to many of you over time. You are good salespeople and your instincts are to say things that are amazing, right? Uh, inflation is gonna continue to rise. Consumers uh, are nervous about spending in uh, the cost of food and the cost of fuel. There is a huge spike in demand for electric vehicles because of pain at the pump. The reality is with inflation, cost of food, consumers can't really do math that well, just $7 at a gallon just freaks them out and they go, I need an electric vehicle, right? That's how you'll sell me, you know, your electrical vehicle startup or project. Great. I'm a true believer. Makes 100% sense. Inflation is pain. Pain at the pump is a known thing. Cost of food and rising. You know, my eggs cost me $7. You might not buy the same eggs that I do or shop, you know, on the beach side in Southern California, but my eggs cost $7 for 12 eggs. Uh, like I can afford them, but also I'm like, whoa, $7. Some, you know, even me with my relatively, you know, attractive income, I'm like, hey, are there eggs for $6.59? So there, so those things are all real, but you have to tie them down with numbers. So examples not tied by numbers are easy mistakes to make. Uh, so the next thing is, and, and this is not the next thing. This is the big idea. I'll read it to you in case you can't see it on your tiny screen. Your company is a financial product. Your company is not a maker of widgets. Your company is not the maker of software. I'm going to make this real for you uh, in a moment. Your company is not a repair shop for automobiles. Your company is not a distributor of sports car parts. Your company is not a manufacturer of furniture. Your company is not a consulting company. You don't own a gym. You don't provide... Uh, uh, monitors to you know online in an e-commerce site. You don't sell blinds. You don't that that is yes, that is what your company is. But it's not. Your company is a financial product. Your company is a financial product that you're selling to financial buyers. Please take a picture of this. Run down to your local tattoo parlor and say, hey, I'm canceling the Mickey Mouse and the Transformers and the Porsche tattoo that I was going to do. Instead, just tattoo this on my arm. I am selling my company to financial buyers. This shift in the lens of attention will make capital raising much more easier for you. And I want to make this real in this way. In the multiple, multiple times that I have worked with venture capital uh, investors. And they have put money into software companies, medical companies, biotech companies, and really, uh, I mean, that's my space, med tech, software, e-commerce, and um, a, a really hardcore biotech, right? Not a single one of those investors 
ever used the product, needed the product, or was interested in the product. I'll say it one more time because they're buying a financial product called your company. In general, they just are not buyers or users of the thing you have. They're just interested in the company. So, uh, you know, if you're going to take some action on this, take a look at your pitch. Get your pitch in the right channel. Get the macros right. Get your timing right. Um, the examples you give, tie down the specific examples, but stop talking about the product beyond maybe one slide. If you have 12 slides, 10 of them are not about your product. 10 of them are about the company and the financial condition, the stage, the channel, the macros that the company exists in. You're selling a financial product, not a physical product or, or a, a software product um, or a service product or whatever it is. No, the, 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 eight out of 10 financial buyers are never going to touch, use, smell, play with, download, experience, or try out your product. So stop trying to convince them the product is the greatest thing in the world. They, do they care? Yes, they care only that your product is competes well and is differentiated and has a marketing uh, capability that's better than the other products and that the macro is trending, the tailwinds are in your direction. That's what they care about. But the, your widget widgetizes better than other widgets? No, not interested. All right, uh, next slide, or are there any other slides? Yeah. I think this is interesting. What then would behind me a pitch deck for a financial product look like? Uh, I might do it like this. Mac mini live, laptop live. There we go. These are slides from real deals in which there have all of these uh, have had one page on the product. Big idea, pro forma, company highlights, um, the objectives of the financing, the opportunity, the management, who's going to you know, get the money and, and invest in the money, the use of funds. These are the slides that are a reflection of a financial product called your company. In all of these decks here, and in this deck in particular, uh, there was one slide or less on the actual product because products are not hard to explain. I bet there, you're not going to meet anybody on your financing journey who looks at your product and goes, I don't get it. Except for uh, Ben, Daniel. <laughs> I think, so I think we've had one, one project in the last three years in which you would actually look at the product and go, God, I'm not 100% clear on it. Can you explain it again? I mean, I'd say, well, you know, one out of 50, but you, and I'm talking to you right now, your product is once somebody sees the cover of your deck and you say, we do X, they go, great, I get it. I, you know, I understand X. I look at X all the time. I use X and my friends use X. I understand why X is important. I understand what industry is X. Da, 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 da. Tell me about the company. I'm spending a lot of time on this because it's, it's you know, a massive mistake that we see all the time. Uh, all right, so the next thing we're gonna get into is, oh, this is a long story. We're not doing long stories today. But what we will do is this window sticker. How up here on the screen is, a, oh yeah, that's what this is. Up here on the screen is a Subaru WRX Impreza. This is the window sticker for an Impreza. Uh, at the time of sale, this was $18,000. It got 27 miles per gallon on the freeway in the city. It got a lot less. These are all the things that are included with the vehicle. The splash guard red is $132, a window sticker. What is this thing? What do I get with it? Like there, so, so the estimated annual fuel cost is $1,911. Uh, the typical fuel mileage, even though these are the bookends are right here at 22 miles per gallon. I don't know if I wanna buy the damn car. I still have to drive it. You know, as I think about the price, but at least I know like the, the parameters, the metrics, what it is. Uh, 
how, what the costs are, what it comes with, what the, how it competes against the composition, a window sticker. Why does your company, your deal, not have a window sticker? Here's a window sticker for the Jeep. Hey, big dummy, you're going to spend $500 in fuel costs over five years. Um, this is the greenhouse gas rating. Over here, you're going to pay $1,095 in destination charge. There's a 60,000-mile guarantee in five years. The base price is $24,295. Yes, you're not going to pay that. Of course, you're going to pay more because nobody ever buys with a base price. You're going to put all this. But at least you know what time zone you're in. You know the zip code. You know if this car is for you other than it looks nice. Um, so what I did over time is I looked at these window sticker elements. What am I doing? Am I sharing screen where? No, that's what you see. Okay, laptop live. Uh, just so you can see those here. Over time, I looked at these window sticker elements and I said, why don't we bake these into our presentations to give the investor context on what he's looking at? It's not the pitch. It's not the deal. They still have to see you. They still have to hear about the company. They still have to hear about the macros and what you're doing, but at least let them understand what zip code they're in. This is a good example. I mean, this is not specific for your deal, but people walking into my deals get a quick boom snapshot. What is going on here, right? Uh, this is what you can see on your screen here. I think I can throw it back onto the stage. Uh, this is a window sticker that raised just this single page, raised $47 million. The investors looked at the pitch deck. They liked it. Um, they, they understood what the company was doing, but they had lots of just questions and couldn't like summarize it. So in a day, I built this one summarizing page and boom, $47 million walked into the company. So I think that uh, I can share it on the screen so you guys can see you know, more specifically what that looks like. All right. I think we're rounding the corner here uh, on the, the basics of raising money today. Uh, while I haven't told you, hey, call Kleiner Perkins, you know, tell them you're an X deal. These, you've got a $3 million pro forma. You'll do $12 million next year. This is the slide deck to send them and go talk to Joe over there. We're, we're just one step short of that. My last suggestion to you, and this is a specific action you can take. I think there's a million people you can talk to who can give you advice on what to put in your pitch deck, how to pitch your company, and maybe a little bit around your financial model. I think until you're talking to someone who is working day-to-day -day in the investment channel that you want to be in, it's difficult for you to connect directly with investors and get access to that capital overhang that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation exists out there today. So there's $400 billion out here. There's your company here. What is the gap between it? Uh, so you're probably, you know, if you're if you're frustrated, you think the gap is, uh, you know, you think the gap is like this. This is better, uh, right? So you think the gap is like is like this. It it's possible that the distance between you and that four hundred billion dollars is it is a thin slice, right? So is it, is it this, is it this, is it this? Is it just you know Im impossible to even, even conceive of? Uh, it's a good question. Oh, I can see, that's better. Uh, and so my suggestion to you is get with somebody who moves money in the channel that you believe you need to be in. Perfect example. If you have a multifamily asset in Southern California, who does debt? financings, uh, debt and equity financings in multifamily in the Pacific Southwest region. That's somebody who you should be working with. If you have a tech company that is, neat, hit, is $25 million and hitting a growth stage, who moves money in 25 to $100 million companies peaking into the growth stage? You have to talk to that. Why do you have to talk to that person? For their experience? Yes. Um, for their uh, instincts? Yes. For their knowledge base? Yes. For their know-how? Yes. But I think more importantly, it's because they know the metrics and the ratios 
that investors today find acceptable. So for example, if you say, you know, you're going to grow at this rate in a growth stage company, it's very possible in your industry, in your macro, in your channel, with the timing you're on for the stage of deal you're on, that growth rate investors don't believe in anymore. And by going in and saying you're going to have this growth rate, they immediately go, I love the deal. I love the entrepreneur. It's like, it's that sensitive. They can love the deal. They can love the product. They can love the entrepreneur. They can love the stage of deal. They can love the assumptions. But if you're saying that you're going to do something that is off macro, it's that sensitive today that, that um, they'll say, uh, hey, this isn't for us. Investors need to get the money out but they also need to check boxes. And I would simplify it like this. You need to talk to somebody who understands what boxes those investors have to check in order to get the money that they already have raised into your deal. As for me, I can help in some areas, uh, let you know exactly what boxes you have to check. What are the numbers next to each of those boxes to give you access to that uh, you know, $400 billion that's out there. So in, in some areas, I can be extremely helpful. So if you're raising money to compete with SeaWorld and build an aquarium to stick sharks and fish and whales inside of it, that's not me. I don't know that channel. I don't know those boxes. Uh, if you are going, if you're helping Biden get a monkey to the moon, great. So excited. I will cheer for you from the sidelines. I do not know space exploration. But there are certain things in terms of financial services, medical devices, real estate, uh, to some degree, oil and gas, definitely technology, SaaS and software. Those are things I understand very well because we help money get into those deals every day of the week. So if you want a little help, uh, then, then you can. Uh, there should be a box below here where you can contact us. Let us know what you're working on. We'll let you know, hey, we are very familiar with that channel. Why don't you jump in uh, a working session with us and let's try and give you the answers to uh, what investors will actually invest in uh, in terms of your company and how, I think more importantly, like how close you are. You, I think we can let you know, hey, you're this close. There's a couple adjustments. Hey, you're this far away from money. This is how you can tighten it up. If you want those answers, happy to help. Jump inside one of our working groups and we'll give you those answers very specifically, examples and numbers. Uh, so thanks for being here today. Uh, uh, Daniel, I don't know if you want to log on now and there's any questions that I can quickly there, answer. There, if not- There are a few, there are a few uh, questions. I, I think most of them uh, you already answered, but uh, okay. I'll bring up one or two. Um, so one was, um, I mean, there are a couple of questions obviously about like how to find the right channels, right? Um, and I think, I mean, that's obviously, that's obviously always a question that is a good question to ask because um, like once you identified the right channel for your deal, it's actually super easy to find the right people. But it, I think it's really, the, um, it's really the exercise of finding the right channel. But maybe you can give some perspective of what yes. are the exercises that you have to go through to this, actually identify the right channel. This, so two things. One is I will see uh, deals come in and because they involve technology, they say we're looking for venture capital. In all likelihood, there isn't a venture capitalist on earth, in Dubai, on the dark side of the moon, in, in, in Switzerland, in Newport Beach, in Palo Alto, in Manhattan, that views this as a venture capital deal. Today, the venture capital channel has changed to be very mature. This is almost like banks were um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, the, their venture capital is not, the, the confusing word is venture, right? They are now investments for stabilized investment vehicles. So just because you are tech does not mean you're looking for venture capital. So this is what I mean by channel. Uh, there is, venture capital is something very specific today that is likely uh, mature in its growth, very sophisticated in its uh, marketing mechanisms, very clearly can be expressed on a spreadsheet and, and um, has the ability to take in, maybe not today, 
but 30, 40, 50 million dollars. Uh, the next, uh, so, so in we're talking about channel. So I think one is, I think you do really have to understand not trying to peg what you do tech to a channel venture, right? I think you have to really say, where are checks getting written today for my kind of company? Not because of the product, but because of the financial product. So um, Dan, I want to answer this simply. In order to know what channel you should be in, you should know what financial product you're offering. Are you offering a high risk 10x reward um, deal in which a highly efficient technology is the product that you're offering into a growth market? That is venture. Let, do you have a, a very technical product in which you are growing 20% year over year? You have your marketing worked out and you only need $10 million to get into your next phase of growth. That is not a venture deal. That is probably a uh, family office, high net worth industry deal um, of somebody who's only looking to put five to $10 million into a company and never wants to put $40 million into. So until you understand the financial product that you're offering, you don't know what channel that you fit in. I mean, I think that's where we could be most helpful is tell us what you're doing, tell us what your plans are, and we'll tell you what channel for investors you should be talking to. So the variables are growth rate, uh, uh, margin or capital efficiency, how much capital you're raising, uh, what you're using the capital for, what your exit strategy is, uh, how well dialed in your marketing is and your, uh, your cost to acquire a customer, uh, a little bit of your track record, what your next 24 months growth curve looks like, and uh, how much you are on a major macro versus just you know, in a growing market. Those are the variables. I don't think there's many other management a little bit, uh, uh, but, but those are the variables that you have to sort out. And once you have those sorted out, then you know what channel to talk to. Once you know what channel to talk to, it'll be very easy to understand if some of that $40, $400 billion of capital overhang is a fit for your company. But this will give you clarity, specificity, direction, shorten your, your sales cycle, your capital raising cycle, and just make your life much, much, much more efficient. So Daniel, that's the answer. Uh, if I understood the question correctly. No, I think that's awesome. And, and also, I feel um, you, like if you're building a pitch and you are like you're able to build it backwards from the investor, you will almost always succeed, right? Like um, I think the biggest mistake that we see is that people just build like a generic kind of pitch and think they can go to to just the market, whoever the market is, right? And then succeed. But uh, I mean, there's so many examples like Henry that we talked to, right? He's he, The only thing that he's selling is like uh, met medical buildings to PE firms. And once he kind of identifies a, a good deal, he can just kind of write up a data sheet, show it to them and they will buy it. But like once you identify yeah. the channel and identify which check boxes they need to check, it's very, very easy to get access to capital because it needs to be deployed. Um, so th I think Man. that's the main job that needs to be done. Yeah, I think uh, in some ways, if you talk to a molecular scientist and say, hey, I'm looking for some water, right? If you say me, hey, I'm looking for some water, I'll walk you over to the tap there and pour you a glass of water, right? But if you say to a molecular scientist, hey, I'm looking for some water, and he's like, well, you know, what water? Um, you know, uh, frozen water, liquid water, purified water, distilled water, um, you know, polluted water, ocean water, lake water, clean water, salt water, fresh water, dry water, wet water, um, ice water, you know, ice, ice that was come from, you know, 20,000 fathoms that was uh, um, drilled in the North Atlantic, you know, frozen Arctic zone or ice that came from the fridge. Like it's the same way with money. You can't just go, hey, we're looking for money. Okay. To like an average person, they would say, oh, you know, money is money. It is a hundred thousand dollars is a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, a million dollars, a hundred million dollars is a hundred million dollars. But when you come to me and you say, hey, we're looking for money, I go, okay, 
you know, what kind of money? Debt, recapitalization, private equity, growth capital, takeout capital, um, uh, uh, equity, subordinated equity, uh, senior capital, junior mez. Um, you know, money has so many different categories, and each of those categories has a different channel, and you drill for it in a different place. All right, Daniel, uh, I myself am out looking for money, calling investors <laughs> and putting deals together. So I have to go back to that work. I assume yeah. this was helpful for you. Here's what I can say. If you're in a startup that you and Joe started, well, that's not fair because we know a guy named Joe. You and uh, 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 Susan <laughs> started <laughs> yesterday at Starbucks. Like this is really advanced thinking. You just need to go out and talk to, you know, a couple dude bros from college, your uncle, Jim, your family, and the local angel network, because, you know, for 25 to $250,000, like this conversation we had today will just blow your mind, right? And you go, I, I don't understand. But if you've got a real company that you've invested dollars in, it sits in an industry, things are happening in that industry, and you really need to find uh, a good channel of perpetual capital to fund your company these things that we talked about today are elemental and fundamental to you guys making uh it, making capital raising work efficiently and that's the last thing i know you can raise capital right but to do it efficiently is the trick so you can get about to building the company and um, beating the competition daniel thanks for inviting me here today Look forward to talking to people out there who have real companies. Uh, we will get in contact with us. We'll give you a, whatever insight and details we can. And hopefully you can jump inside a working group where you can actually make this happen. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so I also put it into the chat right away um, one more time. So if you want to reach out and think you have anything that could be interesting for Oren, right, uh, go to this kind of link that I posted into the chat. It's orenclaff.com slash work with Oren. And then we can see uh, if there's anything that we can directly help you with. And there are like different ways, right? Like there, we have those cohorts they can join. You can hire intersection capital with a mandate, different ways that we, that we might uh, find together and work together. All right. Um, with the recording, we'll see. It is recorded. We'll need to see if we can get it up somewhere. Um, obviously, we always rather have you guys here in person and live, uh, but there might be um, there might be a recording available. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully we will talk in person soon. Thanks, Oren. And uh, let's get back to the coal mine, raising some money.